Well, what were the old cameras like? They're basically the same as this modern one, except a bit cruder, probably without a bellows, and in many cases, many times bigger. This one has a, what's called a 4x5 back. On the front, you have a lens here. You can change the lens. Here's a bigger one. And the old-time photographers probably had two at the most lenses. And that was the most prized part of the camera. This part here is basically a box with a lens on the front and a holder of some sort on the back. These box cameras were quite unwieldy and very heavy. So when a bellows was invented, this lightened them considerably. Even more, a tapered bellows enabled a field camera to be taken out that was comparatively light, only about 10 to 15 pounds. A photographer such as Mundy would have two lenses, a telephoto lens for distance and a wide angle lens to give close up shots. The whole setup for a professional camera was expensive, just as expensive as it would be today to get a top class professional camera. Meanwhile, in the studio, very large cameras were used. There was really no limit to the size a camera could be. And here's an example of Brian Skadden in New Zealand constructing a huge camera. But the simple box camera operates on the same principle. In those days, they had to make their own film plates. So here's a piece of glass. Sometimes it was bigger than that. They had a tent. In the tent, they had to pour special solutions in the dark or semi-dark. The steps involved in preparing the plates were both finicky and demanding. The chemicals were toxic and flammable had to be carried in glass bottles, a particular challenge in the field, and a dipper had to be made or bought big enough to put the glass plate in to contact it with the silver in a dark tent. There was no plastic, the glass could break easily, and sometimes ceramic vessels were made. These obviously were heavy, the other thing was the purity of the silver solution was paramount and many of the top photographers had their own special techniques as we see here with Firth. The steps involved can be got some idea of by looking at this video. After the plate was prepared, it was put on a dark slide and transferred to camera. And while it was wet, put in the back of their camera and take the photo. Now you're obviously wondering why I've got a hat on. The films they had, or the plates, were very insensitive. They took seconds to develop. So whereas this camera here has a shutter on the front, their cameras usually had nothing like that. So what they do is they take the lens cap off and they might have a time of exposure of something like 10 seconds, 20 seconds or whatever. So why the hat? Often they put a hat in front, got everything set up and when they're ready they just took the hat off counted in their head how many seconds they wanted then put the hat back on. It was all very complex in the fact you had to prepare the plate, quickly get it onto the camera, take the photo, how many seconds, one, two, three, four, etc. Rush back to your dark tent and develop that plate while it was still wet and completely finished the process of making the plate. This is a little one. These were much bigger. 
The plate, while still wet, was taken back to the dark tent and quickly developed while still wet. Obviously, this was very finicky, and as soon as dry plates became available in the 1890s, they quickly took over, and in turn, film, and as we know today, roll film took over. Plates were still available for quite some time. Until 1953 or so, you could still get these plates. Here's a box of them I've got. They came in quarter plate, half plate, full plate sizes. The glass plates that were supplied came in defined sizes, quarter, half and full plate. And this obviously restricted the size of cameras if you used these. However, getting back to the old wet colloidon, any size was possible. Some of their cameras took a huge plate, far bigger than this, perhaps 10, 12 by 14 inches. That meant that the cameras were very big, heavy, with heavy tripods, and one glass plate could weigh the same as that beer bottle. If they had 20 or so plates they took out with them, that could be something like six kilograms of plates, far more delicate than a beer bottle, and also very hard to carry around if you accumulated, say, 100, 200 of these plates. If you're traveling around a lot, there's a real issue to keep all the plates that you're collected with you. That's why lots of them got rid of plates or stripped them and used them again. A busy studio could accumulate a huge number of plates. For instance, Bartlett, when he went bankrupt for the first time, it accumulated some 6,000 plates in less than 10 years. That's probably over a tonne of glass. Also note the amount of equipment they had to run the studio. In today's terms, that would equate to several hundred thousand dollars, i.e. about the same as a commercial photographer would have in assets today. So, that's a very quick run through. Once they'd got that image, the only way they could make a print was to take the negative, the plate, and stick it on a piece of photographic paper and what is called a contact print was made. So we have things like this, which is a great big early photograph. That would have been made from a glass plate negative of equal size, something like 10 by 15 inches. In other words, a huge camera and a huge plate. The other thing was you had to sight up what you were doing on the back using a focusing screen. So if we had something like get all this level and get everything set up, focused, go and make your glass plate, rush back, put it in the back, and then take your photo. For instance, the three that Firth made in Thames early on, form a panorama, you would have had the camera like that, taken one, rushed back, developed it, got another plate ready, turned the camera through to the next, sorry, a bit of a reflection on that, to the next position, do another one, rush back, do another one, turn it through that angle. So he had his one, two, three images that he had more or less lined up. These cameras obviously very hard to take around. Later ones, like this one here, were a lot simpler. You could simply 
I can do it. Push that back into here. Fold it up. And you just had a little compact camera like that. This one, you could do a similar thing. But usually you had to take the lens off to do it. But that would fold up into a very similar thing as well. So that's a very quick rundown through what they did. And ironically, they could use the same camera I use today without too much trouble. The shutter would be a bit of an interesting thing. They wouldn't have a shutter. They just had the hat over the front. If I used their camera, I wouldn't have much trouble. As long as they made the plates, there was a really skilled kind of operation. Thank you. And just to add a couple of really nerdy things. The early photographers with large format cameras achieve surprisingly high resolution. Part of the reason was the size of the cameras. Also, unlike film, which has a grain structure, colloidin was wet and by definition had no grain. Of course, everything was in black and white and also red and green did not show up so well on those early films. Nevertheless, very high resolution. The second nerdy thing is working out the location a photographer took his photo from. Often they didn't say much. Here, for example, is one I was asked to comment on the other day. It was obviously taken in Thames, it looks early, and one would guess it was taken by Bartlett during his early visits there. By luck, a newspaper item confirms that. He took it in August 1867. Nothing else was described about it except the vague location. Once you've got the vague location, an easy thing to do, in theory, is to line up the hills behind the photo. This is easier said than done. Modern Thames has a lot of buildings in the way, so you get a vague idea of where it was taken from. When you combine this with archaeological data, you can get a vague position, not exact. The poles defined the outer walls of a pa at the mouth of a Kauranga River, which was probably abandoned about 1820. Just to get this basic information takes quite a bit of work, and I'm grateful to Keith Giles for a high resolution photograph, Dave Wilton for arc site information and John Enterer for giving me some background on the Maori occupation in the area. This triangulation method for working out where a photo was taken from is pretty crude and there are more sophisticated tools which I've attempted to use but don't seem to work so well on the Thames terrain but do have promise. The main one that's in use is shown here.